Happy Friday and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing practical security tips along the way. I'm your host and all-around security aficionado, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting February 9th, 2015. Let's jump right in and share the stories I covered this week. Observant viewers might have noticed I didn't release a daily security bite on Monday, and this is simply because I was out sick. But had I been in, I'd probably have covered a story talking about a researcher disclosing 10 million sets of credentials. Basically, this researcher found all the different leaked password data out there, and he released 10 million clean set of credentials that included the username minus the email address portion, as well as the fully cracked password for these 10 million different users. Now this researcher said he did this to help other researchers study password uh, creation practices. Personally, I think it's kind of a media stunt. This researcher in his really long blog post talks a lot about the Barrett Brown case where this alleged anonymous journalist shared a link to some known stolen data and because of that he might be going to jail. He's already been sentenced. In this post, the, the researcher that shared these 10 million sets of credentials said that he he was sort of scared to release the information because maybe a law enforcement would use it against him. In either case, it seems like just a way to get some media attention. In any case, if you want to learn what passwords to avoid, you can download this set of 10 million credentials. In fact, it might be a good idea just to scan the list for your credentials to make sure they haven't been leaked, especially if you use that credential everywhere. Today's big news is Microsoft's February patch day. Today, Microsoft released nine security bulletins fixing 60 vulnerabilities in products like Windows, Internet Explorer, the Office packages, and their Virtual Machine Manager. They rate three of these bulletins as critical and the rest as important. The most interesting vulnerability is probably an Active Directory Group Policy Remote Code Execution and Security Bypass flaw. In a nutshell, if a bad guy can do a man-in-the-middle attack on a computer that connects to a domain, he can trick that computer into executing remote code. However, in order to do a man-in-the-middle attack, bad guys usually have to be on your local network. On top of that, Microsoft also released a pretty beefy Internet Explorer update that fixes 41 vulnerabilities, many of which bad guys can use in drive-by download attacks. I actually consider the Internet Explorer update more critical to most users. One other note, according to a post on SANS's ISC Handler's Diary, some people are already reporting some problems with some of Microsoft's updates. So although I recommend you apply them quickly, I also recommend you test them before applying them to uh, production servers. Today let's talk about Forbes' big watering hole attack. According to research from iSight Partners and in Invincia, Back in December, Forbes suffered what's known as a watering hole attack. This is where a legitimate site gets targeted and forced to serve malware so that its victims or visitors come and are victimized by the malware. So here's what kind of happened. Forbes has a thought of the day widget and these bad guys were able to infect this thought of the day widget with a zero day flash vulnerability. So that if you visited the site and saw the thought of the day and you didn't have a patched version of flash which didn't exist at the time, it would leverage this flaw to take over your computer and install malware. However, in order to get past Windows's security mechanisms, it also had to take advantage of a zero day internet explorer flaw to turn off something called Windows ASLR, which is kind of a memory bypass security feature. In any case, according to these researches, this allegedly Chinese attack only targeted certain Forbes visitors, specifically some defense contractors and financial services. So this is pretty scary. Watering hole attacks are dangerous. What can you learn from them? Well, there's two things. First of all, you have to realize that every website out there is a potential risk. Even the legitimate ones you trust may be booby-trapped. That's 
why you should never browse the web without protections. And a firewall is not enough. A firewall is going to allow you to access the web on port 80. You need more next generation firewall services like intrusion prevention, advanced threat protection, anti-malware, reputation services, and other things that can clean the web traffic as you're going and visiting potentially dangerous websites. The other thing you should do is make sure to always keep your browser and related software up to date. While patching software won't always help in these zero-day attacks, the huge majority of attacks actually use known flaws, so patching will help you in most cases. Today's story is a TurboTax security scare. It's tax time in the USA with a lot of people starting to fill out their taxes. And late last week, some stories popped up on US media of TurboTax customers who logged into their accounts and tried to file their state returns only to learn that they had already filed them. More specifically, apparently attackers had logged in as them and filed their returns while changing the refund address to another address to get their money. After a number of customers suffered from this sort of fraud, TurboTax actually turned off electronic filing for state taxes for a temporary period of time to research this. Now the good news is it turns out there were no security breaches or flaws in TurboTax's system. Rather, these attackers seem to get these customers' credentials through other sorts of data breaches. Nonetheless, if you're planning on filing your taxes electronically, you should probably know some security tips. First of all, you need to use use different strong credentials at different sites, especially something like a tax filing site. Don't use that credential anywhere else. If a bad guy can steal your credentials from another site and you use it for, say, TurboTax as well, it gives them the keys to your entire tax filing kingdom. Second, many recommend you file your taxes early. This might be good general advice as you might get your refund quickly. But more importantly, you can only file your taxes once. So once you've filed, an attacker loses the opportunity to do any sort of tax fraud. Finally, be sure to secure the device that you're filing your taxes with. Use your general security knowledge, uh, you know, have a firewall, use anti-malware, and be very careful of tax-related phishing emails. If you're getting emails from uh, tax filing vendors asking you to click things, maybe rather than clicking them in the email, you go manually to the site like TurboTax.com yourself. Today's big story is the White House Summit on Site cybersecurity and consumer protection. At Stanford in Palo Alto, California, the White House uh, organized a big security summit where the security experts from many global companies, as well as the president himself, came to talk about how the government and how a uh, private corporation can come together to improve cybersecurity. In fact, I just finished watching the president's uh, speech, and he generally just talked about some of the issues with privacy and security we face with the digital age, and he really encourages uh, governments and private organizations to come together to solve these problems. In fact, at the end of the speech, he signed a new executive order to start sharing intelligence between the government and private organizations. On the surface, these kind of changes are good. You know, I really do want the government to get more involved in protecting its citizens from cybersecurity threats. On the other side, and even the president did acknowledge this, you know, many people are skeptical of governments using this type of power in cybersecurity intelligence to their advantage. In fact, the NSA leaks seem to suggest that they may have done this sort of thing in the past. So that's really where the rub is. While the idea of cyber intelligence sharing is a great thing, it's really hard to know whether the governments you're sharing this information with will really continue to use the information for good and not selfish purposes. In any case, it's a very interesting summit. I recommend you check out the YouTube link if you're interested. And while it is US-centric, a lot of global organizations talked about some of the global ramifications of cybersecurity. So it's interesting to everyone around the world as well. That's it for this episode, but if you want more security news, be sure to follow us at all the usual places. For instance, go to blog.watchguard.com and subscribe to get the daily security bites and many other security stories. In fact, if you want some other stories from this week, be sure to check the reference section of the blog post associated with this video. You can also follow me on Twitter, I'm at SecAdept, or you can follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. Also, if you want to subscribe to my YouTube channel, it's Corey Knock D-I-R. So Corey, 
N-A-C-H-D-I-R. A quick show note before I finish, next week is the U.S. President's Day holiday, so don't expect a daily security bite Monday, but we will start up again on Tuesday. That said, thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you. Thank <laughs> you.